In this video, we're going to continue looking at multivariable functions, but now we're going to look at how do we actually calculate derivatives of multivariable functions. If we remember, what is a derivative? So if I go back to when we first talked about derivatives, what is a derivative measure? Or what is a derivative calculated? It tells you how is the output changing as the input changes, right? It's a rate of change. It's an instantaneous rate of change. Okay. And so what's special about derivatives is that you're looking at a specific point. But regardless, it's this rate of change. But how do I do that if I have two different inputs? I have two inputs here, x and y. And, and like we said yesterday, x and y are independent of each other. Well, the fact that they're actually independent actually makes life easier for us. Because if I want to know how my function changes as one of my inputs change, then the other input doesn't actually affect that. And that's exactly how we're going to do this. What we're going to do is we're going to take what's called the partial derivative in terms of one of my independent variables one of my inputs. Notice how that's kind of similar to just d over dx. But what's different here is we use this fancy d because x isn't the only input. It's what's called a partial derivative. Okay, This is my partial derivative. It's not the only input because y is also an input. Okay, Another way we can write this is instead of writing f prime, if I want the partial derivative in terms of x, I write f sub x of x, y. This means I'm taking the derivative of f in terms of y. Oh, sorry, sorry, taking the derivative of f in terms of x. How is my output value changing as the x input changes? Well, with derivatives, if you remember, derivatives are nice because I can just take it term by term. Well, what's my derivative of 3x to the fourth? as x changes. Well, this term is completely in terms of x, so taking the derivative of this term is follows my normal derivative rules. So my derivative of 3x squared in terms of x is just 12x cubed. Right? I'm going to bring that 4 down. 4 times 3 gives me 12, and then I subtract 1 from the exponent. But what about this next term? This term involves both x and y. But I'm taking this partial derivative just in terms of x. How is this function value changing as I change my x value? So this partial derivative is only asking what happens if the x value changes. So what does that mean we're going to assume about my y value? We're actually going to assume that my y value is not changing. Okay. So with this partial derivative, we're going to assume that the other input is not changing. Another way I can say that is it's constant. So we're going to go ahead and assume that my y value is staying the same. I'm not changing my y value. My y value is constant. Well, in that case, I can rewrite this by moving the y squared next to my other constant. 2 is also not changing. It's staying the same. So 2y squared now represents a constant value because we're assuming that y isn't changing. When I take derivatives, what do I do with constant values? I leave them there. And then I can take the derivative of this term like I'm, like I'm accustomed to. What's my derivative of x? My derivative of x is just 1. So what's my overall derivative of this term? I get minus 2y squared times 1, and I don't need to write the times 1. My derivative is just minus 2y squared. Once again, how did we get that? We got that by just assuming y was going to be constant. We treated y like a constant value and took the derivative of this term just in terms of x. Well, we're actually going to do that same thing with my last term. My last term, I'm going to treat y like a constant value and take the derivative in terms of x. But there is no x term in this last term. So what does that mean that happens to this final term? My derivative is just 0. 
right? If, if y is staying constant, then how is this term changing as x changes? It's not changing. It's staying the same. So my derivative is 0. Just like when you take the derivative of a constant, it just goes to 0. So there's my partial derivative in terms of x. Okay. Well, if I can take the partial in terms of x, I can also take the partial in terms of my other, right? My other input is y, so I can also take the partial in terms of y. I can take partial in terms of y of my function, which I can rewrite as f sub y of xy. Oop, I messed that up. This is a two-dimensional function. And I'm going to treat this very similarly. I'm going to look at it term by term, but take the derivative in terms of y, treating y as the variable and x as a constant. What does that mean about 3x to the fourth? If I'm only looking at when y changes, then 3x to the fourth is staying constant, and my derivative in terms of y is 0. Minus, well, for this term, for this middle term, now I'm treating the 2x as constant. Now I'm treating this part as constant, and I'm taking the derivative of y squared. And that gives me negative 2x times 2y. And last, y to the eighth is in terms of y already, so I'm going to take the derivative of that just like normal because I'm taking the derivative in terms of y. And then I can simplify that. And I get negative 4xy plus 8y to the seventh. And there's my partial derivative in terms of y. So that's how partial derivatives work, is you really just take the derivative of the function in terms of x like we're used to, but anytime you see any other variable, you just treat it like a constant. Take a look at this function. f of x, y is equal to y times the natural log of x plus 2y. Um, and let's find my partial derivative. Let's start with partial derivative in terms of x. So once again, I'm going to treat y like a constant and, where, and just assume that x is the only variable in here. The only thing changing is x. y is not changing. Well, in that case... This two in front, just I'm just going to keep that y there, right? If you have a constant in front of your function that you're taking the derivative of, you just leave that constant there. So I'm going to have y times, uh, since my variable is x, that's inside of this natural log function. So I have to think about, okay, what's my derivative of my natural log? Well, it's, that's just 1 over my inside function. So x plus 2y. And then I take the derivative of this inside function. Well, remember, I'm taking the derivative in terms of x, so I'm just left with 1 plus, well, what's the derivative of 2y? Since y is constant, that just goes to 0. And I'm left with just 1 plus 0, which, of course, is just 1. So what am I left with? I'm left with y over x plus 2y. Okay, well, now let's do my derivative in terms of y. Let's do my partial in terms of y. And this one's a little bit more complicated because I have y times natural log of x plus 2y. This function involves y, and this function involves y. So what does that mean this derivative requires? It requires the product rule. Since both of these terms that are being multiplied involve my variable y that I'm taking, it in, that I'm taking the partial derivative in terms of. So I'm going to use partial, or I'm going to use the product rule here, okay? That means, right, my first function is y, my, sorry, I should use, let, let's use u and v, like we did when we were doing integration. So my first function is, is y, my second function is the natural log of x plus 2y. Take the derivatives of each of these, and, and, and remember, this is all in terms of y, right, because this is my partial in terms of y. So I'm taking the derivative in terms of y. So u prime is just 1, v prime is going to look really similar to what I just did with x. It's going to be 1 over x plus 2y times the derivative of this inside function. Well, now I'm taking the derivative in terms of y. So this becomes 0 plus 2. The derivative of x is 0 because it's x is constant, and the derivative of 2y is just 2. Okay, so that's just 2 over x plus 2y. And now I can put these things together using the product rule u times v prime, I get 2y over x plus 2y plus v times u prime, which is just 1 times the natural log of x plus 2y. And there's my partial in terms of y. 
Let's take a look at an applied problem from your homework. So this is your very last question, question number nine. And we have a sports company that produces uh, a certain product, but the amount they can produce depends on two different things. It pretends on uh, how many units of labor they have, think like how many workers they have working in their factory, as well as how many units of capital, so how much money they're actually putting towards the production process. And so those are your two variables, X and Y. X is labor, Y is capital. So let's take a look at part A. Find the number of units produced with 31 units of labor and 1,145 units of capital. So 31 workers and uh, over $1,000 uh, being put towards production. Well, that's exactly what this formula is for. That's what my function is for. But here, I'm just plugging in 31 for my x value and 1145 for my y value. So this is exactly what it's asking. And all I need to do is just plug these values into my function. 31 for x, 1145 for y. Put that into my calculator, see what I get, and I get... 594,635. Okay. That's how many units are being produced. In part B, now it wants me to actually find these partial derivatives. So let's find the partial derivative in terms of x. That means I'm going to take the derivative, assuming that my y is constant, and take the derivative in terms of my x function. So I will go ahead and pull everything that I'm just going to leave there, everything that I'm treating as constant. I'm going to pull it out kind of towards the front, and then I'm going to focus on the derivative of my x 2 to the 5th. Well, that means I just bring down the 2 to the 5th and then subtract 1 from the exponent, and I get negative 3 fifths. When I multiply this through, it simplifies to just 880 and then now I have x to the negative 3 fifths, and I still have this y to the positive 3 fifths. There, so there's my partial in terms of x. Let's try it out, see if I got it right. Okay, let's check it. Okay, we got it. P sub y is going to be very similar, except I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to treat, I'm going to keep everything, including the x term, I'm going to treat all of that as a constant and then just take a, take the, oh, sorry, that's 2 to the fifth because I'm going back to my original equation, right? My original equation has two, x to the 2 fifths. And then I treat, and then I take the derivative of y to the 3 fifths. So I bring that y, 3 fifths down, subtract 1 from 3 fifths, and I get negative 2 fifths. You multiply that through, you get 1320 x to the 2 fifths y to the negative 2 fifths. Let's check this one. Very nice, we got it. So now, I want to evaluate these marginal productivities. What, is, what, is that, what does that word mean? Uh, well, that's what these partial derivatives were. They were my marginal productivities. Remember that word marginal uh, is, is talking about a derivative. So evaluate these partial derivatives at my specific point, where I have 31 units of labor, and 11, 1145 units of capital, right? 31 workers and $1,145 worth of capital that I'm putting towards it. Well, all that means is now I'm plugging X, I'm plugging 31 in for X and 1145 in for Y just into my partial derivatives. So first I'm gonna plug them into my partial of X, plug 31 in for X and 1145 in for Y, okay? Let me just show you kind of what that looks like, 31 to the negative 3 fifths. 1145 to the positive 3 fifths. Plug that into your calculator and you get 7,672 point something, something, something. But since this is in terms of items produced, right? Units produced, I want to round to the nearest whole. And it does tell you to do that. Round to the nearest whole number. We can see that over on the left side. Okay, let's try it out. 7,600 and... Oh, 73. Okay, got that one. Now I'm going to do the same thing, but with my partial in terms of y. Just plug in those values. 31 to the positive 2 fifths, 1145 to the negative 2 fifths. I'm getting that from my partial in terms of y. And I get 312. Once again, I'm rounding. Now the reason I wanted to pull up the actual homework problem is really based off of this last question. The last question is, 
interpret the meanings of these marginal productivities. So what are, what are these numbers actually talking about? What is 7,673? What is 312? Well, because they're marginal productivities, because they are derivatives, these represent rates. Okay, so let's let's focus on the 7,673. Well, because this is a partial derivative of my productivity, it's talking about production. It's talking about items produced. So this is items produced, but because it's a derivative, it's per something. Well, what were this first one, parcel of x, what am I taking the derivative in terms of? I'm taking the derivatives in terms of my x value, which is units of labor. So in this case, this would be items produced per unit of labor, or in our case, right, we can think of that as the number of workers. So if I add one more worker, I should be able to produce over 7,000 more, more items, more products. Okay. Um, so what, what, let's see if we can find one that matches. Uh, you'll notice that this doesn't mention units of capital because what are we assuming about the units of capital when we take this partial derivative? We're assuming that it's constant. So my capital, so that's an important thing to recognize. My capital is fixed at how much? thousand one hundred and forty five dollars okay so so take a look at part number letter or option c supposing that capital is fixed at 1145 units then a one unit change in labor will cause production to increase by seven thousand six hundred and seventy three units that's exactly what that first piece that's that's exactly what this partial of x tells me and then partial of y is similar except it's it's the other way around this is items produced but instead of per worker it's per unit of capital, okay, uh, per, which a lot of times we're talking about money. If I, if I put one more dollar towards this production, I should be able to produce 312 more items. But what are we assuming? We're assuming that the labor is fixed at 31 workers. And so let's keep going. Supposing that labor is fixed at 31 units, then a one unit change in capital will cause production to increase by about 312 units. That's exactly what this partial of Y is telling me. So C is my correct answer. That's it for this video. Uh, good luck on your homework and let me know if you have any questions as you work through it. And I'll see you in the next one.